Good afternoon and welcome to this Tuesday, December 11th edition of Westman Newsline. I'm Colton Yarch alongside Randy Joseph Lilly and Jordan Olson. In today's news, we'll bring you some disturbing stories about the internet solicitation and the treatment of hogs at a Manitoba farm. And Randy will be in with sports. Randy, I understand the Raptors lost again last night. They did, Colton, but let's talk about something new. The New England Patriots made the Houston Texans look like the Texans of old rather than the dominant force they've been this year. I'll have that and more later on in sports. Thanks, Randy. And Jordan will be in with weather. Jordan, it's pretty darn cold out there right now, but thankfully there's no wind. And I hear things might be looking up for the weekend. That's right, Colton. We've still got some chilly weather to endure for the next couple of days, but warmer temperatures are on the way. Right now in Brandon, it's minus 20 and cloudy. I'll be back with all your weather details later on in the show. Thanks, Jordan. Before we begin, a warning. The details in this first story are very graphic and may be offensive to some viewers. The man who sent a woman and a teenage girl pictures and videos of himself engaging in sexual acts with a dog has pleaded guilty to four charges. 31-year-old Tyson Larry Shields was in Brandon Court on Monday and pleaded guilty to two counts of trying to solicit illicit sex for two separate incidents. He also pleaded guilty to two counts of circulating obscene material. In September, a teenage girl was on a dating site called Plenty of Fish when Shields offered the girl $2,000 to have sex with him and his dog. He then sent her the video of him performing oral sex on his dog. The other woman Shields approached was also on the dating site and he made the same offer to her. An animal rights group is calling for change after hidden camera video showed what they call extreme cruelty at a Manitoba hog farm. The video was filmed at a Puritone Corporation farm by an investigator working with the group Mercy for Animals Canada. It appears to show agitated pigs with open sores and tiny cages, adult animals being euthanized using bolt guns in the head, and piglets being euthanized by being slammed against the floor. Jennifer Brown, a research scientist at the Prairie Swine Centre, says the practices depicted in the video are humane. She says there should be more concern if euthanasia doesn't occur in a timely fashion. Puritone CEO Ray Hildebrand has said in a statement that the company is disturbed by the images, which he says do not reflect the company's animal care rules. About 300 protesters have taken part in a demonstration in Winnipeg against the federal government. The event, called I Don't Know More, was one of several rallies held across the country. Protesters were demonstrating against parts of the Harper government's Bill C-45, which proposes significant changes to the Indian Act. Rally organizers say it includes changes to land management on reserves that make it easier for the federal government to control reserve land. A new report says Manitobans have the cheapest utility bills in the country. People in this province pay an average of $814 per year for electricity compared to the national average of $1,300. Heating and car insurance costs in Manitoba are also about the half the national average. The highest utility bills are in Ontario. And with that, let's take a look at where today's money markets are currently sitting. Westman Newsline, produced by the IMA Media Production Students of Assiniboine Community College. Local news, weather, and sports on Brandon's only TV newscast, Westman Newsline, airing at 1 p.m. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday on WCG-TV. Turning to international news now, they're known as some of the most formidable fighters among the Syrian rebels. But Washington says the Al-Nusra Front is really an alias for Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Just as Syria's rebels report more progress on the battlefield, the U.S. government is ready to brand some of them terrorists. As, a as CNN's Relitsa Vasileva reports, the group emerged from a vicious and mysterious past. January 2012, Damascus. An arrow points to the suicide bomber. Moments later, a massive explosion. <laughs> deadly aftermath of the attack on security forces in Damascus. A cameraman positioned to capture it all. A little-known group Jabhat al-Nusra claims the deadly attack and posts evidence online. 
It is the first radical Al-Qaeda style fighters had come to Syria. In the following months, Al-Nusra will emerge as Syria's leading calling for violent jihad against the al-Assad regime. Some Syrian rebels suspect the regime created it to discredit the opposition. But there's evidence that in some places, al-Nusra fighters have worked with other rebel brigades. The name Jabhat al-Nusra will quickly become associated with the most spectacular attacks in Syria's civil war. Like this one, in May 2012, two suicide bombers detonate a thousand kilos of explosives. Though the intended target is the military intelligence building in Damascus, the force of the massive blast wreaks havoc on a university and residential area nearby. Attacks like this one, suicide bombings against government targets in residential neighborhoods, are shunned by the more mainstream armed groups. Jabhat al-Nusra is reported to have some foreign fighters in its ranks and receive logistical support from Iraqi jihadis. Despite its extremist tactics, the well-organized group is slowly winning credibility, offering serious armed opposition groups help in their fight against better equipped regime forces. For example, joining forces with other Free Syrian Army brigades in this November attack on an airbase in northwest Syria. And it may be gaining some acceptance among civilians. This YouTube video purports to show demonstrators in Idlib waving the Al Nusra banner. In November 2012, Jabhat Al Nusra says it has won the support of 14 armed groups for this online statement. The groups reject outside efforts to unite Syria's disparate opposition behind a democratic transition and declare Syria an Islamic state instead. The armed groups later recant their support for al-Nusra's statement. But the longer Syria's bloody conflict goes on, the greater the risk... We apologize for the technical difficulties. Archaeologists in Florence, Italy may have unearthed the secret behind one of the, one of the world's most famous paintings. They found a skeleton that could belong to the woman who posed for Leonardo da Vinci's masterpiece, The Mona Lisa. The smile has perplexed art historians for centuries. Leonardo da Vinci's priceless masterpiece, The Mona Lisa, or La Gioconda. In the frigid bowels of what was once a convent in Florence, television producer turned art researcher Silvano Vincetti is leading a project to find and identify the remains of the woman who posed for da Vinci more than 500 years ago. Historical documents seem to indicate that this is the place where Lisa Gerardini, otherwise known as Mona Lisa, was buried. Beyond that, it's all a mystery. The remains of five females have been found here. This skull may be that of Lisa Garardini, the second wife of a wealthy Florence silk merchant. The remains will be compared with the DNA of two relatives buried elsewhere. No other likeness of her has ever been found, and given that da Vinci spent years working on the painting, it's possible the real Lisa Garardini bears no resemblance to the Mona Lisa. Once we identify the remains, Vincetti tells me, we can reconstruct the face with a margin of error of 2 to 8 percent. By doing this, we'll finally be able to answer the question the art historians can't. Who was the model for Leonardo? Possiamo finalmente dare una risposta. The smile, on the other hand, will probably remain a mystery. Vincetti claims scientific analysis suggests the smile came later. Quando Leonardo iniziò con la modella che aveva di fronte, when, he says, Leonardo began painting the model in front of him, he didn't draw that metaphysical, ironic, poignant, elusive smile, but rather he painted a person who was dark and depressed. The smile Vincetti and others have suggested may belong to da Vinci's longtime assistant and some believe lover, Gian Giacomo Caprotti. While other art historians claim the painting was actually a surreptitious self-portrait. So we may never know if the smile was, as Nat King Cole sang, to tempt a lover or simply to confound humanity. 
Ben Wiedemann, CNN, Florence, Italy. That's it for news, but stick around. Jordan's up next with Newsline Weather. Good afternoon with Newsline Weather, I'm Jordan Olson. Well, the weather outside isn't quite frightful, but it certainly isn't warm. Happily, there's no wind, although we expect breezes to start blowing later on tonight. Currently, it's minus 20 with a partly cloudy sky. Winds are northwest at 6 kilometers an hour, and there's a 20% chance of precipitation. This evening, we'll see the temperature drop down to minus 21, and expect some light snow. Winds will be from the east at 20 kilometers an hour. As I mentioned, the winds will pick up and the temperature will drop as we head into the wee hours. There's a good chance we'll see some scattered flurries and the temperature will warm up just slightly to minus 19 degrees. Turning to our radar image now, you'll see there is no, nothing above the Westman area, but look out for the snow that is traveling across Saskatchewan. Turning to our satellite image, you'll note there is only a thin layer of cloud in our sky at the present time. Taking a look at our five-day forecast now, We'll be seeing partly cloudy skies for the remainder of the week with a few chances of flurries. Temperature will be around minus 23 over the next few days, but with that wind chill, Thursday will be feel more like minus 26, so bundle up if you're heading out. As we approach the weekend, it will warm up to be around minus 10, so things are looking up for the weekend. Taking a look around the region, Winnipeg is in at minus 2, Portage is also in at minus 2, minus 22, as well as Dauphin is in at minus 22. Nipah is in at minus 21, Carberry is in with minus 22, Killarney is in at minus 20, as well as Minidosa is also in at minus 20, Vernon is in at minus 22 to round us off. Seasonal norms for this time of year are a high of minus 9 and a minus 19 for your low. Records for this date were set back in 1943 when the high was plus 5, but in 1975 a frigid minus 31.7 was the low. Again, it is currently minus 20 and partly cloudy here in Brandon with only a 20% chance of precipitation. That's it for weather, but don't go away. Randy's up next with news on sports. Good afternoon with Newsline Sports, I'm Randy Joseph Lilly. The Brandon Wheat Kings were able to defeat the Red Deer Rebels at home in overtime on Saturday, and they will look to continue their winning streak tonight against the Saskatoon Blades. The Wheats are struggling this season, currently sitting second last in their division. The Blades are second and will try to win their third in a row. The Houston Texans may have the best record in the AFC and may have been one of the earliest teams to clinch a playoff spot, but the New England Patriots showed them last night that they still have a ways to go. Playing on the Pats' home turf, the Texans dropped a 42-14 decision as Tom Brady passed for four touchdowns. Aaron Hernandez was a big target for Brady as he caught two passes for scores. New England has won seven games in a row and is now 10-3 on the season. The Texans are 11-2. The Edmonton Eskimos are looking to Ed Hervey to get the team back to a winning organization. The former Eskimos wide receiver was introduced as the team's new general manager. He had been their head scout for four years and was considered one of the two frontrunners for the position, along with head coach Cavis Reed. The Raptors' five-game Western road trip ended in miserable fashion. LaMarcus Aldridge had 30 points and 12 rebounds to lead the Portland Trail Blazers to a 92-74 victory over the Toronto Raptors on Monday night in a game that was overshadowed by injuries for both sides. Toronto also lost reserve Amir Johnson in the second half after he was ejected for arguing with an official. Johnson threw his mouthpiece and had to be restrained by his teammates before he left the court. J.J. Hickson added 16 points and 11 rebounds for the Blazers, who were without starters Nicholas Batum and Wesley Matthews. The Raptors lost forward Andrea Bargnani to a right elbow injury and guard Kyle Lowry to a right shoulder problem during the game. And Colton, that's all for sports. Thanks, Randy. And that's all the time we have for you today. Be sure to join us again tomorrow for Brandon's only TV newscast, Westman Newsline.